everyone, and welcome to Breaking Geek Radio, the podcast, the premier flagship and usually international podcast of LRM Online on the Genreverse Podcast Network. At the end, we'll give you all the details on where you can find us, which is everywhere. Um, today, we were going to do an Operation Mincemeat review, but only one of us saw it, but I'd still like to review it. And we have lots of trailers and some Star Wars and some Marvel and even some anime news, just for jammer's sake. Um, oh, I am joined oh, by anime t- news. Yeah, I still I don't think it's stuff you'll like, but I'm going to tempt you with it. Um, of course, I'm joined by All right, Jammer. I'm open. How you doing, Jams? What's up, Jamster? Oh, I'm doing okay. Never go on vacation. It only means more work in the end. Unless you work at Amazon, where you don't have to catch up on anything. You just have to have the days off. That's true. That's true. I should work at Amazon. No. No. Um, so we have a host. We're going to start, as is tradition, with some movie trailers. And I we have four movie trailers this week, um, ranging from Green oh, they're Women. They're not all movies. They're not movies. Not no, all on movies. TV. Trailers. We have four trailers ranging from go. Green That's Women better. to uh, Chris Hemsworth being Chris Hemsworthy. Um, only not. It's this crazy role. So first, let's talk about... Operation Spiderhead. No, it's just Spiderhead. I keep wanting to call it Operation <laughs> Spiderhead because I saw Operation <laughs> Mincemeat. Um, but I will give the synopsis before we get into our thoughts. Um, in a state of the art penitentiary run by brilliant visionary Steve Abnesti, Chris Hemsworth, inmates wear specials, wear a surgically attached device that administers dosages of mind altering drugs in exchange for commuted sentences. There are no bars, no cells, no orange jumpsuit. And Spiderhead incarcerated volunteers are free to be themselves until they're not. At times, they they'd be a better version. Need to lighten it up? That's for that's a drug for that. And loss of war for words? There's a drug for that too. So Jammer, what did you? This Jonesy shared us this trailer, and I had no, you know like almost any Netflix project, I had no idea it was coming, no idea what to expect. What did you think? I'm not gonna lie, Netflix is. Uh... I'm not really all about Netflix these days. I Their movies tend to be kind of boring and bland. Uh, I feel like that's a really broad statement for me to make for someone that, that for, an org, for a company that really throws out just content constantly. But I feel like their movies are really, really mostly missed for me. So it's really difficult for me to get excited about kind of anything they push out unless there's some sort of extra buzz connected to it. Um, so I really didn't know what to expect from this one when we got the trailer or when I saw the trailer and it looks like it looked like a lot of fun. It looks like it could be really unique, um, but I also did kind of get some. What's the word? Uh, don't look up vibes from it. Not, not quite as it's not as uh, satirical on a political level, obviously. Uh, it's more about, I guess, satirical in terms of humanity and then companies. Uh, uh, immoral companies in that way but it, it just looks like it could be fun but it also looks like it could be relatively paint by numbers a little bit empty which is kind of what I felt about don't look up um, where it was it, it was cool and I enjoyed it but at the end of the day is it something that's going to stick with me I'm not entirely sure I do like the director Joseph Kos- Kosinski um, oh I, I didn't like see all the director content. like Tron yeah and Oblivion yes. I think yes Yes. So, um, I I mean, obviously I like Chris Hemsworth. I think he's a great talent. Miles Teller. Well, I can't say I like him. He's good in everything he does, which is an interesting distinction between the two, between liking an actor and understanding that they do relatively well in most of the roles they do. Uh, Wasn't he Speed Racer? No. No. That was Emile Hirsch. Uh, I I used to confuse those guys a lot. But now Miles Teller is like risen to the top. I know, they but at the time they were very similar type actors, and now um, that's weird. Miles Teller's like risen to like the cream of the crop, you know, being in Top Gun even next month. Yeah. Overall, it, it was a fun trailer. Um, I'll definitely be interested in at least checking it out while all the while still being a bit bored that it's going to feel paint by numbers when all said and done because Netflix. What about you? I thought it looked awesome. Again, yeah, I agree with you about most Netflix movies that. You know, the trailer looks great. And then you watch it and you're like, oh, OK, that was fine. But I really love the premise um, and the cast. It actually reminds me of Rainbow Six. There's a whole subplot in that book about the 
like people who don't know why they've been captured and they're like in the cell and no one's watching them and they're given drugs that like make them want to have sex with each other and everyone's naked. So it kind of gave me vibes of that storyline. We probably would never even get in a rainbow six movie because it's too complicated. Um, and I don't know, uh, the ma- Chris Hemsworth gave me uh, bad times with the El Royale vibes. You know, I like seeing him kind of play. He's not doing his action hero, hero thing, which really doesn't work out for him unless it's extraction or Avengers. But um, I don't know. He's I playing just... his sort of Machiavellian uh, capitalist type where it's just like, eh, we're just going to do the thing. And, you know, whatever. Who cares about the people or the consequences? I love his line about like how uh, good looking people get away with stuff like this. And he like refers to he's like sometimes myself, you know, that, that's not the exact line, but I found it quite amusing. And yeah, it just, it also reminds me of uh, it definitely looks like an A24 movie. I would say in terms of. Oh, concept. I wouldn't say that. Oh, you don't think no. so? No, not even close. It, it feels like, it feels like a Netflix movie. Which is because I think the really high concept, really interesting concept, fantastic cast, competently made. I guess my main concern has to do with there doesn't never, and actually this is weirdly ties back to Marvel. So stick with me here. How Marvel, even if you look at Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, or even some of their weaker movies, a lot of them, you could almost say that they are character focused to a fault as opposed to concept focus. So even in like Dr. Strange and Multiverse Madness, which I thought was a pretty, a relatively mediocre, but still a good time. It was a good time because they somehow get away for you to invest in the characters and their journeys, even if the, the technical aspects are there, even if some of those, there's tons of plot holes here and there, oh, you yeah. still kind of care at your at the core and it kind of drives you forward and it still manages to be entertaining. Whereas a lot of Netflix movies that I've seen, they have these cool concepts. That they that they are really cool, work really well, fantastic cast, but there's no real core narrative in terms of uh, character arcs. And it's just, it's really difficult to connect with and therefore uh, difficult to watch and, and be and not be bored watching for me. Um, and I kind of get that feeling from this, that there is the potential for that. Maybe I'm wrong. But that's I kind of what I, that's what I think leads to the hollow feeling I have to where I like the concept I think it's funny I think it works the satire works but I still don't feel that emotional connection that I'm wanting and that's kind of what I'm, I'm concerned about for this movie even though as you said it looks great it literally is just a Netflix branding mostly along with sort of the satirical comedic edge. I um the other thing that reminds me of a little bit just mostly Chris Hemsworth is a uh, ex Mahina um oh just like he reminds me of oscar isaacs because there's oscar even a scene isaac. where he's like dancing and stuff and it's like yeah it could be a fun character and i don't know i'm excited for it um and to counter your netflix claim i just watched knives yeah, yeah. out with it's my a, roommate very... this this year i mean yeah this week and he was blown away and i was blown away i didn't remember how amazing everything from the acting to the dialogue is knives and out is not a netflix movie but knives out two and knives out three are netflix movies in right. fact, it's not one of the stories we're covering, but real quick, they're going to give it a 45 day movie theater release window because it is such a big property that yeah. they don't want to just suddenly be like, hey, here's Knives Out 2 for free at home. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, the, I, I, like I said, it's a broad, it's a broad stroke that I sort of painted right there because Netflix puts out so much content. There's also a lot of amazing stuff. It's just with a lot of the high, pro, uh, high profile ones that I've seen, there's just they're kind of soulless. Interesting. So I like don't like up, but I would agree it's not everything it could have been. Well, which um, kind of takes us back to our, our conversation we had last year when Enola Holmes came out. To me, that is by far the best, most entertaining Netflix movie I've seen. Because they bought it Enola and they Holmes. didn't make it. <laughs> exactly. Because they bought it. It came from a studio which has created, obviously, every movie's made by humans, but I feel like it felt less driven by an algorithm and more driven by, you know, uh, studio execs who have a more classically trained idea of what a story needs in order to be impactful on an emotional level um, that Netflix doesn't really doesn't seem as interested in. I guess related to that, we'll see how Anola Holmes 2 turns out versus the first yeah. one. Yeah. Now that it's a Netflix <laughs> is that, franchise. Is that straight to Netflix? Is that straight yeah. to Netflix? <laughs> it's one of their originals they're excited about this year. Um, Cause they released yeah. a trailer with like all the movies, including there's going to be a great, hopefully great, but again, it looks like a Netflix movie. Uh, the one with uh, 
Chris Evans versus Ryan Gosling as like competing spies or whatever, which mm-hmm. they've only clips they've released from it were in like that montage of like all the movies where that each character even looked at the camera and was like, I'm in a Netflix movie or like some shit. <laughs> but <laughs> let's move on to the next trailer, which should go a lot faster because you don't give a shit. Um, so you say The Boys season three. Did you probably oh, didn't right. even watch it, right? No, I didn't watch it. Oh my God. At least some of the imagery you should have watched. Have you have you seen any pictures of Soldier Boy in his full costume? They really yeah, updated like his Jensen suit. Eccles. Yeah, well, they really updated his suit to look like the MCU Captain America suit, which is interesting. There's even the there's even the shot from Civil War where he's but he's actually beating someone all the way with his shield because obviously the superheroes are all asshats. Um, right. But it looks great. Homelander is more unhinged each season uh spoil swipe a spoiler alert for the if you want to shut off for just a few seconds at the end of the last season he uh ended with homelander jerking off while flying over the city and being like i can do whatever the fuck i want and it's just he becomes more unhinged each season this how is op- that a spoiler well i mean it's the last very last scene of he jerks two. off in a plane spoiler how not in a plane a flying over the city because he's superman <laughs> Okay, how is that a spoiler? That's just weird I to say. Know. Oh, he jerks off. He, he jerks off over a city. Spoiler. Well, because he becomes more unhinged. Like that's where that's the moment where you're like, oh shit, he's no longer. I mean, he's he's a terrible person who kills a lot of people. But now he's like, I don't even care about being a superhero. I just want to fuck people up. Got but, it. Okay. And we see a lot of that in the trailer. And the big difference is uh, they've discovered a drug that lets you be a superhero for 24 hours. So Billy Butcher is kind of breaking his own rules because he hates soups and he takes it and has like laser vision and stuff and is able to actually beat the shit out of Soldier Boy. Um, and there also seems to be a giant rivalry between Soldier Boy and Homelander or Soldier Boy is becoming more. I don't know if they unfroze him because he is he's the Captain America story. He served in World War II. He's back. So I don't know if and they seem to have a rivalry like, oh, he's becoming more popular than me or maybe Vought's using him as the bigger face of Vought. And there's definitely... That's leading to Homelander's craziness. And last season, spoiler, if you haven't seen season two, he has sex with a literal superhero Nazi. And so the trailer opens with him, like a montage of him on every show and the screen fills up with him on all these shows being like, everyone makes mistakes when they're in love with people. But he didn't know she was a literal Nazi who was married to the creator of Vought, who was a German scientist in uh, World War II. So maybe they'll even tie that into... Uh, soldier boy but yeah that's why i thought of the boys looks fucking diabolical like always ready for like, another trailer like the animated series diabolical well there's also that's a line that butcher says in like the main trailer for like season two he's like fucking <gasps> diabolical which is why they called the show that oh there you go i learned something i watched one of those shorts with the, jonesy when he was in town right yeah it was not for me what <laughs> i watched it i was like eh. Not for me. It's a little each cute. one's very different, though. Like each one's a different animation yeah. studio. Like one of them is by Rick and Morty artists and creator. That was one the one I written watched. By Seth. Yeah. Well, yeah. Of course, that one's not for you. The first one's cute. It's like a Who Framed Roger Rabbit, only it's a laser baby that, that the scientist is trying to protect and like chase around the city because it's the baby keeps following red balloons and stuff and slaughtering people every time she sneezes because she has laser vision, but. <laughs> Are you ready to talk about a Hulu Disney old 20th century picture? So Disney movie that I'm surprised yeah. is not going to theaters. Prey. Yeah, let's talk. It's not even called Predator Prey. It's just called Prey, which I respect that a lot because usually it's like you got to put the franchise name in the title. Yeah, I've heard about this one. We just finally got the trailer. I heard about it only because it. people are like, do you know Prey is a Predator movie? And I was like, oh, shit. And then, well, how long have we known about this movie? It's been a uh, year. It's been known about for for a while there, Jammer. Uh, even the fact that like the setting, uh, the uh, like three hundred years ago setting and all that, at least, yeah, th- if not year and a half. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, it's first, I've heard of it, or at least that I remember. Here's and it was su- a pleasant surprise. Uh, here's the synopsis before we get to how pleasantly surprised you were. Um, set in the C- Comanche Nation. I actually know how to pronounce that one. Uh, 300 years ago, Prey is the story of a young woman, Naru, a fierce and highly skilled warrior. 
She been, she has been raised in the shadow of some of the most legendary hunters who roam the the great plains. So when danger threatens her camp, she sets out to protect her people. The prey she stalks and ultimately confronts turns out to be a highly evolved alien predator with a technologically advanced arsenal resulting in a vicious and terrifying showdown between two adversaries. And obviously the trailer is very simple. It's just, we see indigenous people like do it like running. And then they just hint at the predator at the end with like the clicking and the laser lights and stuff. Are you a fan of the franchise at all, Jammer? Have you seen many of the predator films? Yeah, yeah, I've seen all of them except for the latest one, The Predator. I did not watch that one. I watched all the other ones though. Um, yeah, and I, I like them ironically. Obviously the first one I think is my favorite so far. The second one is clear, is Predators. I think came out 2010. No, that's the third I, one is I, Predators. Oh, your second favorite. Yeah. Yes, my second favorite. Um, I really, I thought that one was a lot of fun and was disappointed to get a follow-up, but. Um, yeah, I like Predators but, you know, actually better than the first personally. Yeah, I, th- I could see that. Um, I was actually kind of going back and forth in my head. I was like, do I like it more? It's like, it's hard to say because the first one has that nostalgia factor. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas this one that didn't, or that one didn't as much. So yeah, I mean, I think I'm a fan of the franchise for sure. I'm kind of also one of those people kind of like, do I really need to see another one? I don't think so. But at least this one seems like it could be different. I'm interested to see what what they're going to bring to the core emotional story that is going to make me care on a different level from any of the other ones. So that's kind of where I'm standing with it. Like I'm intrigued that trailer caught my interest, uh, the teaser caught my interest rather, uh, and we'll, we'll see what further trailers bring to it. But, you know, I'm not rushing out to see this one, but because I'm, I'm not really super excited about the Predator uh, brand, but I'm not completely closed off to it either. And of course it's gonna be on Hulu, so you don't have to rush anywhere. <laughs> you can just right. pull it up at home. <laughs> And yeah. thankfully, even if you don't pay for a trailer, I mean, a uh, commercial free Hulu, their movies are just straight through. They don't throw their commercials in their movies. Thank God. Mm. Um, what do you think? Are you excited for this? Yeah, it's, I mean, almost the same. I'm not a huge, I have seen all the Predator movies in theater. Well, not its first two, but I have seen the ones that were released during my lifetime in theaters, even the Predator, which was, had potential and then wasn't that good. Um, mm. And it ends the same way as a, independence day uh two where it's like now we're taking the fight to him and like void hallbrook like gets like a predator suit <laughs> like a robotic predator suit <laughs> with all their technology and then obviously nowhere it's not going anywhere um right but this one catches my eye because it is the predator is basically well the predators was fascinating because it's them on a different planet a game reserve you find out not even just the predator planet and um has that great twist i won't ruin with one of the people brought there. Wait, it's a different planet. This is on Earth. No, Predators. Right. Oh, Predators. Predators gotcha. I thought... And then the okay, Predator sorry. is very cut and paste, like the first two. Um, mm. But this looks very interesting because of the time period switch, and he's not going up against yeah. humans with machine guns and stuff. He's going up against ind- indigenous people. And I do like in the synopsis they do put a an emphasis on Naru, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, who's the main character. And I hope that there's some real good development in that area. Still shocked. I mean, I guess shouldn't be shocked that Disney is putting out movies like Predator and probably another Aliens eventually. But it's still well, it's weird. Like Disney. It's well, it Disney, is. but I mean, don't, it's 20th it Century Disney. Fox. It's greenlit by it is, Disney. But, I mean, <laughs> but it's different. My point is, it's not like the Disney branding. No, but so like, don't be surprised still. if they put out, put out mature stuff. No, that's still, they have the 20th Century Studios they have the flexibility to do all the mature stuff. And most the of the content on Hulu is 20th thing. Century Studios. Like all these great cr- cr- like dramas, I was going to say crime dramas, they're not all crime dramas, are made by 20th Century Studios on Hulu. And they're if all very hard. the Disney branding, I would be surprised. Yeah, like, they obviously um, I'm won't. surprised that we're getting a, a Daredevil series under Disney+. Plus. That surprises me. But 20th Century Studios branding doesn't confuse me. Do you think uh, even if they make him part of it, think- part of the MCU, which they will to an extent, I think they'll kind of keep them a little bit separate, that Deadpool will be uh, 20th century pictures. I have no idea. I, I couldn't even speculate. My guess is no. My guess is going to be Marvel Studios. And- oh. oh, and that makes sense too, because yeah. they never put Disney on the Star Wars, like in the, like there's no Disney logo in front of Star Wars or Marvel. I'm saying you watch those yeah, movies, no. you don't see the castle. It's Correct. just the Marvel logo and the Lucasfilm logo. Correct. So yeah, I, guess, I think it's gonna be yeah. Marvel. 
It'll be Marvel Studios. That'd be my guess. Because, yeah, it's not like they swap, slap Disney on there unless the production company. And then again, it's more of a production company thing than it is brand. I know it is more branding than production company when it comes to choosing 20th Century Fox or uh, 20th Century Studios or Searchlight, no longer Fox Searchlight. But yeah. Right. But we are, I still consider it Disney to an extent. That way I can make this segue work. The final trailer <laughs> is a Disney Plus show called She-Hulk. Maybe you've heard of the character, or at least the other character in the trailer. Uh, She-Hulk Attorney at Law. Attorney at Law. I forgot they added a subtitle to it. And this they reminds did. me of, before we get into the trailer itself, I was uh, interviewing three of the Broken Lizard guys before uh, the Denver premiere of Super Troopers 2, or like press screening, you know, premiere, like they were there and all the important people in Denver who produced it were there. And because the guy who played Farva, I'm forgetting the actor's name, was in the, the short Captain Carter, not the TV show, not Captain Carter. Yeah, no. Agent Carter. Agent Carter. He was in the short, not the actual show. And I'm like, oh, so you've been in Marvel before. What what character would you, what Marvel character would you like to play if you had the chance? You know, everyone asks every actor that. And he was like, She-Hulk. And all three of the Obviously. guys are like, yeah, She-Hulk. We'd love to play She-Hulk. She, she be hulking around was like their joke. But now we finally have She-Hulk and none of them are starring as her. Disappointing. It's a travesty. So what do you think about the trailer? There's been a lot of talk about the CGI in it. And we'll go into some more She-Hulk news after we discuss the trailer. So I have a weird opinion. I think if, if you're... And this, I, I, I probably have some contradictions that I said in the past. But like if you're... I think you're allowed to say, yeah, there's a problem there. Like it doesn't look, it doesn't, or you could say you're allowed to say it doesn't, the CG doesn't look great. But at the same time, if that's like your focus, I feel like you're watching movies and TV shows wrong. Just like, don't focus on that. Like it's, it's, it's passable. It's not perfect, but it's TV and it's, it's passable. Would I like it to be better? Yes. Could it possibly be better down the line? Yes. But I'm not going to let my enjoyment hinge on whether or not the CG looks good on She-Hulk or not um it just seems like it just seems like the wrong way to focus on these because mm -hmm. of how high budget they are and how much money they cost it's like i kind of expected there to be some cg issues so like that didn't bother me i guess there was a couple points where i was just like you know first seeing her i'm like oh that's that's what they're doing with this interesting but i wasn't bothered by how the cg looked it was pretty much to be expected um did I like the trailer? I thought it was really goofy, mm -hmm. really silly. Um, it was one of those things where it's like, it, it seems like it could be a lot of, a lot of fun, kind of turn your brain off type of fun movie uh, that really, that I can really connect with the character on. And I just thought that line about her, about being, you can't be angry or scared or whatever was just really, really funny. When you're um, a woman. Just, <laughs> right. Like, and then also, <laughs> that joke at the end with her carrying the guy off the couch, I thought was really funny because I could just see that as a sort of like the fetishizing of it. And I'm just like, Oh yeah, I'm sure that guy has never been picked up or just like, or coddled by anyone since he's been an adult. He's just like, yes, this is my time for my <laughs> very specific kink to come out. And um, I, uh, before you continue, I made the mistake of looking at the comments below the trailer today. And they're oh like, God. oh, she could step on me anytime. And one guy's like, I want to rob yeah. the bank so that she'll throw me through a wall. <laughs> yep. That whole it's, shit. It's, it's like it's a thing. the vampire in a the super tall vampire in Resident Evil 8 where it's like, oh, she could step on me. And it's like, Ugh. but yeah, overall, I just thought it was uh, it was a good time. Like I had I had a great time watching it. And I think whether or not it actually is great we'll have to wait and see the tv shows have been fairly hit or miss for me like i think wandavision built up fairly well but then kind of fizzled out at the end yeah the i don't like the end hawkeye so hawkeye i actually think hawkeye is i feel like the most well-rounded and solid it's the most consistent for me um and i really like that uh then there is loki which i thought started great and ended great but had a saggy middle mm -hmm. um then you had uh, Falcon. The other ones here. Falcon and Winter Soldier, bleh, kind of boring. I kind of got bored about two. I think it's the most in. cookie cutter, but I love it the is. characters. It's, so, and then um, Moon Knight. Uh, and what if Moon Knight? Moon Knight. Who Moon Knight for me? It was like really good, and then 
it was the hardest drop for me. I had two like episodes. The ending? Okay. I thought the last two episodes were the best part. And speaking of CGI, they, okay. they did not spend any time on the hippo or uh, uh, the, the hippos looked out. The hippos looked out. The, the animals looked okay. They looked fine. I think the biggest thing for me is when they were on the hippo's boat and just sort of the backgrounds, mm-hmm. they looked rough. But again, I don't really care about that. But it's, it, for me, just on a story level, I got I got bored watching I'd say most of Moon Knight. Like it had the hardest drop off of any show that I've had. It, it recovered some of it, but it didn't take it in any way that was unexpected. I'm like, okay, he's an alternate personality. You get that from trauma. Or you have you can get that from trauma. It's very, very rare, but you can get it from trauma. It wasn't a huge revelation to me. Um, which is, you know, not a huge deal, but it was fine. It was fine. Mm-hmm. I really like Steven though. I think that my, I think maybe the biggest problem is I like Steven way more than I like Mark and Mark took up too much time for me. And he was kind of boring. I do like their dynamic with each other when they are like in separate bodies, but mm-hmm. so the, yeah, I agree about She-Hole. I think She-Hole looks like a lot of fun. Um, I didn't even really notice the bad CG. In fact, I didn't realize she was a CGI character at first. I thought she was just, they just painted her like Lou Ferrigno in the original Hulk. And made her big. Yeah. Like did some camera effect and just painted the actress. Cause yeah, it, do- it doesn't, she's not as detailed, which obviously wouldn't have as much detail. Cause Mark Ruffalo looks the same quality as in the movies. Abomination looks almost the same quality as when we saw him in Shang-Chi. Of course, of course has a big budget. Um, yeah. I dig the comediness of it. It's their second, con- well, it's their second 30 minute series. Cause WandaVision starts as a comedy at least. Um, I mean, I wouldn't call it a 30 minute series. I think they're as long as they need to. So this is a 30 minute show. Yeah, because our ne- my next news story before uh, before I give my final thoughts is that it's nine episodes long. And Faggy okay. said all series will be s- six hours. So that's the same as WandaVision, nine episodes. Um, and the comic's very funny. Um, in fact, she's kind of a Wade Wilson. She will talk right to the reader. And I wonder if they'll incorporate that into the show. Which because there's none of that in the trailer. And then I don't think so. And it'll be Based interesting. On the trailer. See, I think it'll be interesting to see how they do her origin. Kyle, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't she get a blood transfer from her cousin? And in this, unless it happened before Endgame, I don't think you could really break the Hulk skin to do a, a blood transfer. So I'm assuming it happens before Endgame, where he's just Professor Hulk. Well, we I, have seen him. We saw him with uh, in Shang Chi as in human form. Hulk. Yeah. Oh yeah, at the end he is. Yeah. I forgot he wasn't just Smart Hulk. Uh, just so- yeah. something that I caught on online for that guys. Uh, in in the IMAX cut of the of Song Chi, there's taller frames. You can see a uh, device on Hulk's non damaged hand. Uh, it's got a green green light on it. Um, it's possible in my mind that that's might be uh, some tech from that Gamma prison that uh blomsky blonsky is is in uh so something that enabled him to go back into human form as as uh punishment i, I don't know what you know if he was i assume he did that himself did it to heal to be the hulk all the time do it some something like maybe hulk couldn't heal the the arm the right way and the human side could i don't i don't know but there's a device device there yeah and it's interesting that yeah it was very interesting to see tim roth in it because i figured we'd just get it was weird. abomination but it was really cool i love when they bring back characters from movies that aren't as well liked like i really mm-hmm. hope justin hammer is in armor wars that would be a real treat i know it would be a tragedy if he wasn't i know i, I need more that's justin like the hammer. thing that they do they they take the things that no one likes and makes them essential so that you have to begrudgingly like them like returning to thor 2 and endgame yep. one of the most yep. beloved movies they return to one of the least beloved movies because also those guys did a rewrite on, on it, so an still uncredited waiting rewrite. On, uh, Liv Tyler and her return. I don't think we're gonna see that at this point. But then I again, so I didn't think either. Natalie Portman would ever come back, and now she's like buff and like one of the stars of the next Thor movie. So and also and just... getting also having people wanting to step on them. So <laughs> did you see the this great meme? I think Kyle may have even been the one who posted it where someone posted it in our, our discord chat where it's like he's just like um anakin skywalker he was no no uh 
yeah, he's kind of like a, he was tra- trained by Qui Gon Jinn for a while because Qui Gon Jinn, uh, Liam Neeson plays like his older and Men in Black counterpart, and is training him. He uh, he he dated Padme, uh, aka uh, Natalie Portman, and uh, what's the last one? Shit. It's got uh, from Men in, again? from Men in Black. It's got he he was trained by Qui Gon from Avengers. He he worked for Mace Windu, and That's then the it. last one is from Thor. Uh, Thor: Love and Thunder. He dated Pad Padme. It's funny. <laughs> so I got some She Hulk news. If you're done talking about the trailer, yeah. I mean, is it the news that you already shared, or is there more news? There's a little bit more. Um, okay. One so yeah, of course it's nine episodes. Um, a very interesting story related to it is that Wong is confirmed to be in it, and of course we've seen him a lot lately from uh, Shang Chi, um, Spider Man, and Doctor Strange, and it seems like it's kind of becoming a Wong like. And of course, even, yeah, even at the end of Shang Chi, he's there with Captain Marvel and Mark, uh, not Mark Ruffalo, uh, Bruce Banner. So people are like, he's probably going to be a pretty important Avenger going forward why not have two sorts and he's the sorcerer supreme right now not even like yeah just so i think it's interesting he's making the rounds almost in a nick fury way right now where it's like oh a new marvel project gotta get wong in there gotta get cinematic wong 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 universe wong cinematic wong cinematic universe yeah exactly wong cu wcu so what's what's the news he's in it Oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> but I have one last story. It's one. Um, yeah, they don't have much details. He's not officially listed, but it, it is confirmed that he's in it. Um, By who? I don't know the exact outlet that originally confirmed it. And I just deleted uh, the, the my tabs. The direct. So it's not confirmed. It's a rumor. I guess. I think it's pretty concrete, though. I think a lot of people have sources that are saying it. Um. And it would make sense for him to pop up, especially since he was kind of seemed like he was rehabilitating Abomination in Shang-Chi. Mm, yeah, I guess it would make sense for sure on the story level. Yeah. Even though otherwise you'd be like, why, why is a She-Hulk show or a Gamma show need Wong? But exactly. So, And uh, at LRM, we have a follow up story to all the rumors about She-Hulk being having trouble behind the scenes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Nick, the uh, confirmation came with the show's cast. He was listed in in the cast. Uh, Oh, so yeah, that is excellent. The direct was just reporting on on that. Nice. Need that Wong. Gotta have my Wong. Um, (laughs) So the quote that we got um, on, you know, there was like I said, it it was months ago. There was a rumor that it was a big mess. And some people debunked it, but we have a new quote on LRM online, our bar side buzz. And it refers really to more. Quick, than, yeah, really quick. So the original news story came from Jeff Snyder, right? I think was so. that the original yeah. quote. So the, the original quote uh, now I want to give the quote. It says, so Moon oh, nice. generated about half the initial viewership as Hawkeye and many fans seem to dislike it intensely. I recently discussed the question of whether Marvel has a creative problem on my podcast, but even from a purely business perspective, Marvel needs to figure out how to generate Avenger level interest from non Avenger property. The upcoming She Hulk is supposedly a mess. I've heard, even with Mark Ruffalo in a small role, and Miss Marvel is another big test for fans. Nobody's saying Marvel's TV output is in trouble, but it's something to keep an eye on. So is that, that the new the, quote? No, that was the old one. It's the only quote I'll I have in the article. Let me look. Because there's no new quote in the article, I guess. Kyle, do you, I'm looking at the article right now, but I'm trying to find. Oh, here we go. You're confused. confused no, here, here's what it is. According to Puck News, they're apparently. OK. Baloney now says Bella Belloni. No, I'm sure I'm slaughtering it now says the same thing in his recent article. So it's a second it's a second source on a similar story yeah. that we've heard in the past. So we'll see if that has anything to do with the final project. If it turns out meh or, you know, if there maybe we'll hear more before that from further sources or, you know, maybe it is debunked. Maybe even the recent guy doesn't know exactly what he's talking about. 
it's often hard. It's hard to say the other way because most of his article is behind a paywall. So I think generally the only thing that's being spread around is that he also says it's a mess and that's kind of where the news stops. And But the context that I gave is that months ago, however long ago, Jeff Snyder, who is definitely an insider uh, scoop person, gave that quote that I said. Okay. He also was confused. Sorry, guys. He also jumped in on a uh, on a the tweet for our article, retweeted out, and basically asked, you know, what were people supposed to say when when they uh, uh, disputed his claims? And I mean, yeah, of course. What what else is you Who's know official he? channels? Maloney? Snyder. No, Snyder. Snyder. He uh, quote basically tweet. rebacking up his own. Yeah, original that, that's all. I he mean, was like, like, what would Disney say? Yeah, what, great. what would what would the official cha- channel say? It's it's one of those things where where there's there's been a lot of talk from uh, reliable sources and some additional stuff thrown in from from not so reliable sources. So you don't know if they're just actually throwing in th- things they've actually heard or trying to you know put a spin on it for for clicks or whatever. But uh, yeah, it's it's not news to to the general pu- public that it's had rumors of of trouble. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's this is a nice segue. Uh, we can continue on with Disney Town, and we're moving into two pieces of Star Wars news, Jammer, and our dear audience. Um, there's lots of Star Wars news this week, but I pared it down to what I thought the two most interesting elements of. Uh, was ver- I can't remember the publication that had that they just had a big spread, and you know we we grab a lot of all of it's us Vanity new Fair. Vanity Fair, which. I kind of shocked me a little bit. That's why I was like, I can't remember. I was going to say variety, but they don't think they even do print anymore. Um, but, it, you know, lots of quotes to grab from that for all like our site and all of our friendly or competitive sites, whatever you want to call the other people. Um, frenemies. So, frenemies. So this is one of Kathleen Kennedy's quotes about the future of Star Wars. We have a roadmap. I would say that Taika's story fits more specifically into that Rogue Squadron. We kind of pushed it off to the side for a moment. Patty is developing the script further. Then we will talk with how it connects to the central spine of what we're, what we're working on. There's a couple of filmmakers that we've been in conversation with over quite a long period of time. And I'm hoping we'll come in and make overall commitment that John and Dave had made. That's, orig- that's ideally what I would like to see happen in feature space. Okay, and then then she was asked if she meant like Kevin Feige at Marvel sort of direction. She said, I wouldn't go that far. Kevin is an anomaly, an amazing one. But the goal is to definitely ha- having somebody make more of a commitment. I hesitate to use the word trilogies anymore because Star Wars is much more about persistent storytelling. So what do you think about KK's? Oh, persistent one second. storytelling. Uh, need to give some con some context here. The Vanity Fair article uh, was recorded. Uh, was you know the interviews were done uh, a couple mo- months ago. Since then, especially with her Kevin Feige comments here, trying to make it sound like she's not got him lo- locked in. Since then, Michael Waldron, Michael Waldron himself has has said, "I'm writing the movie for for Kevin Feige." producing okay so and isn't um it was it a rumor was in the article that uh john watts is doing a star wars uh it um, had been rumored that he was directing and now it's uh uh official that he's produced showrunner not not okay. directing but produce uh showrunner so yeah keep that that context that some of these comments are months old and we've since had some additional confirmation interesting yeah that's that's good context to have considering yeah like Stuff has happened since then, but here we have this big spread because right before Kenobi comes out, it had that great cover with like Pedro Pascal. Well, I'll just say the characters' names: Mando, Obi Wan, uh, Ahsoka, and uh, I can't remember the fourth. But you know, Reva from he... uh, she's the Inquisitor. Is that okay, the Inquisitor. About? Yeah, yeah, from uh, Kenobi as well. Mm-hmm. And it's like it's one big happy Star Wars, you know, TV show family, even though Kenobi won't interact with the other characters based on the time period. He'll never meet Mando or Grogu. Maybe he knows Grogu. I guess if he knew Grogu, we, Grogu, we would have heard about him before. But then again, that's not how not Star Wars works. That's not how that's- Star Wars works. Yeah, no. Um, really quick. So I w- I'm curious, what does she mean by persistent storytelling? 
I hesitate to use the word trilogies anymore because Star Wars is more about persistent storytelling. What does that mean? Does anybody know what that means? Any Not thoughts really? as to what it could mean? I think she's trying to say it has more of a direction right now than does like it, does it mean just that? like maybe more like it definitely she's making i think she's making up for the sequel trilogy a little bit with these comments being like yeah we got a plan like then again it's like we have all these directors who might be doing stuff for us eventually she doesn't mention ryan johnson in it how do you feel about her her comments about uh kevin feige about not having a direct kevin feige i just i think that's more of flattery and just knowing that there hasn't been another kevin feige yet dc needs one star wars needs one um but like yeah kevin feige's the master of interweaving stories that are still standalone enough most of them that they're fun and you know they they start their plan like 10 to 20 years in advance ever since the first phase so it's just i think that you know every studio would love a kevin feige your franchise not all of them have it how many years in advance did you just say they plan 20 years in advance? They say they have a 20 year plan right now. Feige has no, no 10, 10, mm. not 20, like 20. They didn't have 20 year from the get go. Well, they of course not a, from the get go. Like, like I feel like phase can, one barely had a plan except for the test. Yeah. Round. Phase one barely had a plan. I feel like they, they're usually a handful of movies. If that ahead tops and then they kind of have a basic, maybe overarching idea, but like things change constantly as evidenced by many of the little plot holes throughout the, 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 the MCU that people conveniently forget when talking about other things. Um, anyway, uh, regarding Kevin Feige, I, don't, I, think, I don't think it's flattery. I think she might be onto something because we all ideally want a Kevin Feige, but at the end of the day, how realistic is it to expect that we could have another Kevin Feige? Like he is an anomaly. Yeah, like it is. It is something that is unparalleled, and it hasn't been matched since. Even when they have tried to do that, people want to say have a Kevin Feige, but is it maybe like chasing an unattainable mm-hmm. thing by trying to lock down another Kevin Feige? Like, is it the worst thing in the world not to have a Kevin Feige because you're just going to try to ape something that you can't possibly replicate effectively? And that's the interesting part. It's because she's asked about it. It's not like she brought mm-hmm. it up and she's like, oh, he's an anomaly. Like, we, no, we're not yeah. going that far, but, you know, we're trying to have more of a plan like Marvel has a plan. Yeah. So you don't think she's wrong? No, not at all. Do you think they should be looking for a Kevin Feige? I think I like what they have going with the TV series right now, where it's Filoni and Favreau kind of guiding all of it. Um, but that's just the TV front on the yeah, I know. front. We don't know. We don't want to know what the synergy is there. Because I would put, I would make Filoni and Favreau in charge of all of it if I was her. Like they make the plan. Um, but it still feels like they're tr- trying to play fast and loose with especially doing um, single films instead of trilogies all the time. Um, where it's like, oh, let's, we have the Kevin Feige one. We have the Taika Waititi one. Maybe the Game of Thrones guys are still doing one. We got Jaddy. Patty Jenkins, and hopefully they've learned to give them more freedom, which Marvel likes to balance. You have to do this storyline with freedom as far as like Thor is completely different tone, even the first two Thors or like Guardians is like way different than a Captain America movie or like, yeah. So I feel like um, hopefully she's giving them more freedom without firing them before the movie starts or in the middle or the end of the movie. I think they need to be on the same page because clearly they're not on the same page when they hired them. Um, I do think Lucasfilm in the past has had difficulty in that they, they seem to strike directors when they're hot without really talking things through. And I just hope that they Lord uh, and Miller. do that. I mean, Lord and Miller, Josh bl- Trank, Release their Colin cut. Trevorrow. I know. Um, yeah. I mean, even, even like D and D, Patty Jenkins, because uh, Taika Waititi. I mean, obviously they've worked with Taika Waititi in the past. Ryan Johnson, like they're striking where the iron's hot without maybe having an idea of what's going for. I guess Ryan Johnson is a little bit different, but it's like they announced it and they really liked what he did, and no one else did. And now it's just kind of like, oh, maybe, maybe we'll push that back. And that was announced know, after people disliked Last Jedi, wasn't no, it? No, it wasn't. It was a, it was announced a couple months before. Ooh, yes, it maybe was, it is yeah. dead because of the fans. 
Yeah, I think it was announced like the August, if I recall correctly. Like, the August it also seems before. like he's moved on considering we're getting two back-to-back Knives Out films. You know, he's, he's moved on, but at the same time, one of those movies is already done and he's probably neck deep or waist deep in the other one. And that'll be done realistically uh, in about two years. So he's not going to be booked up for that much longer. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see what he does after Knives Out, if it's more his personal, personal stuff or even more Looper, which, you know, is very different than his other stuff. Obviously, it's his movie. Or if he decides to do a franchise like Star Wars in the future and bring his wit and style to it and just visual game. Yeah, just like he brought in with The Last Jedi. Agreed. Like his visual style. He has less freedom there, obviously, but his visual. That's one of the most striking Star Wars movies with imagery, like with the the salt and like the snow on the salt. And uh, just lots of red. It was striking. Um, It's so striking and one of the most thematically sound Star Wars movies we've ever had. Exactly. I would agree. I'm sure Kyle does not sitting there plucking his beard. I know he doesn't hate it like Cam or something. No, he doesn't hate it. He's more he's more receptive to the positives. What? What? Sorry, I was reading this Ryan John- yeah. Johnson quote. That's fine. He, he was. No, that's no big deal. It was that you're, you're more uh, accepting of Last Jedi than a lot of people, like especially Cam. Uh, you'd be surprised how what what Cam is accepting of. It's it's that there are certain things that just cross cross the line, and for for the most part, neither one of us are in that Jake Skywalker camp. You know, he is Luke. We would have just preferred to have seen more of why he got got that way type stuff and and then the awful awful technologically wrong beginning in bombers fuck you jam jam oh my god <laughs> it's just you're watching movies wrong you're like you're, you're you're watching movies wrong so actually uh they would never be they would never have gone into production with those models because they are not technologically sound more, more like they already Star had Wars. stuff jam jammer they already had stuff and and you can't even blame uh, it on I'm on selling toys to uh, on selling toys because they didn't sell that as a freaking toy. <laughs> I'm not listening. Not leaving a Lego set. Now, anyway, uh, let's move on to the, I think the most interesting quote to discuss because they've actually broken this rule. But Kathleen Kennedy says uh, they learned a lesson from Solo. There should be, oh wait, let's see. There should be moments along the way where you learn things, Kennedy said. Now it does seem abundantly clear we can't do that as far as recasting legacy characters. And that's interesting to me because there are another news this week is that the Moth, Moth, Mothra, Mon Mothra. Um, <laughs> Jeez, Mon Nick. She's already been recast, obviously, um, in a. In the past, though. Th- yeah, but she she's was, really she confirmed. Rogue One. Well, I'm having some power issues in case I drop out. My flight seats keep flashing because we're getting rain now and snow later um, oh, yeah. in April. Ro- yeah, my computer just flashed again. Um, yeah, she's already, but she, they confirmed she's coming back for Andor. So they're still okay with reusing people who have been recast. Because no one complained about her. That's why. I know. And it's not the same she's as replacing a, a Harrison character. Ford. Just yeah, yeah it's way different. Character. But I'd still she's rather see like man. Sebastian Stan play uh, Luke in. Of course he would, because you were in love with Sebastian Stan. Well, he looks like enough like Mark Hamill. And Mark Hamill, the de aged Mark probably. Hamill, still looks creepy as fuck to me. Like it holds up yeah. once. If you watch the episode, you're like, ugh. I and like one of the tricks just not use legacy characters going forward and move on. That's my opinion. Yeah. But go ahead. I would agree. But Mandalorian is so deep in that. And Soka is so deep in that, that, you know, Luke appearances and we'll probably get a Jedi Academy show. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Can, I think they can move forward with the Mandalorian and not use another single legacy character and be totally fine. Boba Fett, I'm sure will pop up quite a bit in the future still, but that's, that's the original cast. <laughs> I mean, it's not, but that's the guy who played the clones. So, yeah, yeah, that's true. Obviously, it doesn't matter who the original guy was because, yeah, because he hears voice he like twice. A, yeah, he's just a, just yeah. stand in uh, I always, I always, those, those lines from Empire, I always just remember the original voice completely different. I, I, I never really, it always felt weird hearing um, Tamara Morrison's voice because I always remember this delivery was so different. Like, the original was like, he's no good to me dead. And the new one was like, he's no good to me dead. And I was just like, <laughs> that doesn't, that doesn't work. I mean, it, it just feels different because I grew up with one and not the other. Yeah, there. Yeah. I don't think I've, I've never seen them many times. I don't, what? 
Didn't we have another, you have another quote that we interrupted you on? Like you said, I have one more quote. And then we kept talking, interrupting you. No, that's the Ka Kathleen Kennedy one. I already said it. Which where, one was um, it? She, this, the quote is, um, well, the article talks about how. Oh, um, oh, legacy characters, legacy characters. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or recast it. Like, I think because that's one of the things she blames Solo's box office on that. Not the fact that they released it like four months after Last Jedi and just you know, reshot the entire fucking thing and like, like release yeah, the film curious. Lord Miller cut. <laughs> I'm curious, it, it, like, what are the legitimate reasons behind it? How much of it had to do with The Last Jedi? How much of it had to do with the release schedule? How much of it had to do with not accepting new solo? It being an awful yeah. movie. And how much of it had to do with being a movie that was lukewarm that most that a lot of people didn't like though i will say a lot of people are i feel like they're coming back around to that movie a lot of i liked it are starting to come out of the woodwork and you've always liked it nick i know day one so it's you can, like you can hold on to that Han. well most people um, claim oh i don't like it because i actually like han solo as a character and hate everything they did with him in that movie that i know that's kyle. <laughs> kyle that's kyle <laughs> um i just thought of another recast that they're like using heavily fuck slip oh i mean obviously they've recast even though it was in the original trilogy uncle owen um but again that was mm. another character people i mean he was different age so it's smarter to but they, recast they also than... used him they used him already in yeah in episode three trilogy. so it doesn't it's not quite the same and also I, I just... because he, he's the same he's, he didn't recast him Oh, he did recast him, I guess. Because there was but an old guy. He's been able to age up yeah. into that role. Yeah. I Holy. forgot about it. We always <laughs> make the, the joke. Movie. <laughs> it's like Tatooine had so many years. Like, this were 10 years before A New Hope. And yeah, I know. Obi-Wan uh, and him look fine. <laughs> Ewan McGregor has uh, not very much time to get old. They should have added more gray to his beard, I think. It would just be a way to, like, I mean, he still has another more. 15 years. Still has another 15 years. This has been, this year I got here has been about five years. Um, and for those who don't know, I'm pointing to my gray hairs on my sideburns. Hopefully you're watching. Yeah, on YouTube. yeah I mean, if you're not, you could be, yeah, if you're not, you should watch on YouTube with the Genreverse. Uh, you can channel, check out his Reed Richards hair. Podcast <laughs> network. Um, I think I had more to say, but I guess that's about all for that. It's just, I don't know, a lot of people were pointing to the, uh, the hypocrisy of saying that when they've done it plenty of other times, and it's did not affect well, the I box think office going forward going forward is just something to go in. i mean i think i agree it's the wrong lesson that they should take from it but you know what are you going to do studios have a long and storied history of taking the wrong lessons from box office failures so or not exactly a surprise or sometimes something yeah. so successful it's like we all need deadpools now <laughs> at our studios yeah yeah so i mean it, it sucks <coughs> that they came to that conclusion it's not surprising, but at the end of the day, I am, I don't think we're losing anything by not focusing on those legacy characters unless way. they decide, <laughs> unless they decide we're going to, uh, we're going to Mark Hamill, everyone from the Mandalorian, in which case and, I'm just like, please no. Um, they talked about that on Corridor Crew, who's like one of my favorite guys to watch. They both do their own special mm -hmm. effects and, and mm -hmm. uh, look at other people's and judge it. And they noted that one of their main reasons it, they were able to make it look less uncanny is almost every time he talks, you're not seeing his mouth move. He's looking a different direction or you're at Grogu's height and you're hearing his computer voice, not even his Mark Hamill voice. But because that was a yeah, program that like did that. Most of the problems I have with it, I think have to do with his line de delivery because it's so flat. Because it's a computer. <laughs> yeah, I could tell. <laughs> I could tell it's a computer. And it kind of fits Luke at that time period where he's like, you know, he's very peaceful. He is the Jedi. He doesn't have emotions. But at the same time, you're like, feels uh, and sounds off. Wow, my computer keeps flashing. Let's keep going then. My next story is the anime story just for Jammer. Otherwise, Ooh. I wouldn't have shared this one. Really? I don't even like Rick and Morty. I know, but that's my question. With this, Okay, so here's the no. description. The no. Have you seen the shorts they've done? Because the same guy who's making this has already done two. And they're very like anime, like it's it's so all like just, it's samurai stuff. Um, well, Cartoon Network has hired a 10 episode adventure um, of Ricky. It's called Rick and Morty, the anime. And it will be separate from the 
series um, and it will adapt themes and events from the original title. The upcoming anime will mark yet another Rick and Morty adventure for Sano, who previously directed two anime shorts, Rick and Morty versus Genocider and Summer Meets God, Rick and Mo- Rick Meets Evil, which do look very impressive. Like, and they're so unrelated to the show, these shorts. Yeah, they're like, it's just a completely different world. They're, like, Rick does a bunch of samurai stuff and is dressed like, it's almost like Star Wars Visions, where it's like, yeah, it's Rick and Morty, but it's obviously just different, just different completely. But no, still not interested in the Rick and Morty project if it's a... Uh... I mean, here's the thing. I'm not into anime because it's anime. I'm into some anime shows because some anime shows have really good stories and really good execution. So just because it's anime doesn't necessarily mean I'll be more open to it. If people say it's amazing, maybe I'll check it out. But at the end of the day, people love Rick and Morty and it's just not my cup of tea. It's, I mean, you know this, it's not, it's too mean spirited for me. It's a little too dark for me. And like, it's, I understand the appeal. It's just not for me. So if it's more like that, chances are maybe I'll watch an episode and kind of go from there, but I'm not anticipating to love it, even if it is great. You should check out the shorts and you can judge it on those. And I haven't watched the series, I would say. Which shorts? They already did like two five minute shorts by the same guy who's animating or is in charge of the animation of this one. Um, Just as advertisements for Rick and Morty. And, you know, just something you throw on Cartoon Network between episodes of stuff. Got it. But they're pretty impressive. They look very cool. Um, Like I said, very similar styles. How come those look cool to you? But then the anime doesn't look cool to you. It's not for me. It's the opposite of my problem with anime. It's a lot of the themes and stuff you like, and like the type of anime you like, is just not for me. Um, okay. But so it's the animation, the I lo- I love some of the ways a lot of those shows are animated. I think it's beautiful, but mm. a lot of the ones you've shown me are just not my taste. Is all. All right. I have nothing, and I still need to watch Star Wars Visions, but that's more of a... I still don't understand how you, you like Summer Wars, but you just don't really like it. It was a good watch. I yeah. don't know. I wouldn't watch it a second time. Yeah, I know, and I'm trying to understand why. You don't need to see it more than once. I don't need to see every movie more than once. No, I know that, but I mean, why do you don't like it more than you do? Because for me, I can verbalize why I don't like Rick and Morty. It's just not, why, why it doesn't fit my personal taste. What is it about Summer Wars that doesn't fit your personal taste? I don't, I don't need to verbalize anything. If anything, the person who likes it more should convince the other person with their comments. But I don't want to focus on Summer Wars. I don't want to run too long. Um, I have a short review. Um, our episodes do better when they're a little shorter. Um, I have I know what Danny may have seen it last week. We it was one of the movies he mentioned. There were like two movies in theaters, and one of them was Operation Mincemeat. And I know you're gonna get a chance to watch it, Jammer, even though it's on Netflix. Like you said, a busy, busy mm-hmm. boy catching up with a uh, vacation, coming back from vacation, back to the real world. Um, it yes. is based on the true story from World War II, where. Actually, I even have a quote at the end of the movie. They like they run dialogue. They say, here's how important it was. Operation Mincemeat saved thousands of lives. It is now celebrated as the most spectacular single episode in the history of deception. Um, so the idea is in order to convince the Nazis and Hitler that um, they were going to attack a, uh, Greece instead of Sicily, which kind of left Sicily unguarded mostly. They found a corpse, made up a backstory for the corpse, uh, went through. It's insane how much detail they go through in this movie. Like they make up a fake girlfriend and like even put like an eyelash in one of the letters to show that it hasn't been read because someone's eyelash fell off into it. And, like had to deal with like, well, we can't use ink that's waterproof because the Nazis will be like, why are they using waterproof ink? on A normal letter because they so they find their corpse. They give them a backstory. They drop them off a submarine. They find off, their corpse. Well, like they body? have to go to a lot of morgues to find like the right not de- Why someone are they using who using bo- a body for this. Well, because they 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 make up a backstory for this body that he's a um, officer who's carrying these important letters that the okay. Nazis aren't supposed to get, and so they Got plant it. them on him, um, throw him off a submarine very close to the Spanish coast where he is then found, and uh, the documents. You know, whether or not, it, I mean, it's history. It works. The documents get to 
Hitler, <laughs> he pulls people, he it puts works. people in Greece instead of Sicily. And there's a very successful uh, land landing party, I guess I'll call it at uh, on the beaches of Sicily because Hitler moves a lot of the troops over to Greece. But it's very interesting you know, story. And, 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 you know, very little of it is about the actual results of it. It's all about, you know, it defines corpse. Like where do we find someone who drowns? Like how much we, we have to make sure this letter reads like it's a real letter. And like, here, let's write a letter from his girl for his wife or girlfriend and like include a picture of her and like, whose picture are we going to use? Um, before uh, I deleted my, one with uh, it's 80 something percent on Rotten Tomatoes, uh, 6.7 on IMDb and Google users gave it like an 86 or something as well. Um, but it stars Colin Firth. Like I, I say this all the time, at least uh, the British movies about World War One and World War Two always get the best damn casts. Like you think of 1917, you're like getting five minutes of Firth, five minutes of a uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, War Horse. You have like Benedict Cumberbatch and um tom hiddleston and uh so it stars colin firth i'm just gonna read the ones people will know um it has jason, jason isaacs Isaac. yeah uh, a lot of people will know who i was looking for Kel- kelly mcdonald who is most famous for playing lou ellen's wife in i know country for old men mm. um she has a great accent even in this as a brit sorry she's a very very irish accent it's her real accent um, and, uh, Mike Gatiss, who used to be just a creator of shows, he created Sherlock, but then he ended up playing Mycroft in that series. And he, he's one of the, you know, British actors in this was in it for like three minutes. And one of the characters who's actually narrating it as he writes the book is Ian Fleming, mm. which is very interesting to me. And some of the things I learned from it, like I won't, I described the movie. I don't need to go into spoilers, but also about their interpersonal relationships, these people who are putting this project together. So that's where most of the drama comes from. Um, I did not know Q Branch was a real thing, but there's Q Branch. And I think some of this what is what uh, I like in Bond, Q, where he gets all oh. of his... Uh, there's even a scene where the, some guy has a gadget. It's like a watch that like he's, he's along with the heroes, the main characters, because they get some equipment from Q Branch. And it's like, what's this? And it's like a watch. And it's like, oh, Turn it on. It's this blade starts spinning. He's like, yeah, it's to sharpen your enemy's teeth or something like that. It's funny. But um, they even use the term M, even though it's not the same way as Bond. They call um, Jason Isaacs M because uh, and the reason is, is that one guy starts doing it. And they're like, why are you calling him that? He's like, because when I say M, I think of my mother. And she's the most terrifying person I can think of. <laughs> so, and again, Ian Fleming is writing the book about this and narrating it as it goes on. Um, By the way, before you get any further, I will say, if you if you like James Bond, you should check out James Bond, the un- untold drama behind the world's biggest spy franchise, which is a video that we have on the Genreverse Podcast Network. Where channel. you're watching us now, hopefully. <laughs> yes. And um, it was just interesting. So, like, at one point, someone thinks someone's brother is like a Russian spy, and they're kind of there's a whole conversation about, oh, Russia's on our side, and you know, the whole thing where it's like, yeah, but they won't be after the war. They're like, we're going to be at war with them next. And just... Very prescient. Yeah. So wait, before you get too further and like sort of just going through moments of the movie, what are your, what's your Twitter review of Operation Mincemeat? Actually, all I have to say about it. But um, I liked it a lot. I enjoy it. I would recommend it. Um, even people who really don't like violence still recommend it because... At the end, there's a short scene where they're storming the beach at night. It's, I mean, it's, it's not like anything like Saving Private Ryan or Hacksaw Ridge. There's very little real violence in it. It's just about putting this operation together. And like I said, most of the drama comes from interpersonal relationships between the people who are in this top secret program that is Jason Isaacs actually hates it, his character, but it's actually Churchill. Churchill is the one who won't let him cancel it himself. So it's a very interesting, you know, you get your elements of building up this fake operation and then you get to see the relationships between like um, the two main guys in charge and uh, Kelly McDonald, you know, Colin Firth, they kind of had a thing and it's just, I don't know if you, it's, it's a good world war two movie without being violent. If you're not one for violence. 
So like, I even, there, if you don't, you can't stomach violence, then this is okay for you to watch. Yeah. If you don't want to see a corpse that often though. Which, but you don't see the corpse get killed. No, no. You see a corpse. Okay. Yeah. And they're like trying to make him look more realistic for like a photo. And they're like, he just looks dead in all of these. So they, they just, find a we different can, guy. We can burning him. Do they put sunglasses on him? and put a, <laughs> That was my joke. Around. When Danny was starting to describe the plot, he's like, it's about them using a corpse in World War II. And I'm like, what? Is it like Weekend at Bernie's? Two soldiers are carrying a corpse. And they're like, shoot this guy, not us. We're not dangerous. <laughs> he's the marksman. <laughs> but that's not what it is at all. I just imagine them having like a line of dead bodies and just have people, like everyone has their corpse. They hold them up that way. It looks like they have a whole army when literally it's like <laughs> half the size. They all get mowed down with a machine gun anyway. <laughs> that's that's what World War like, I and World War II were. <laughs> Um, so what would you give this movie in terms of a rating? I'd give it a solid B plus. Oh, the B plus. What started. are the, what are some of the things that are shortcomings for you? Like where did it not hit, hit the mark perfectly? Well, I would say it felt a little long. Um, and I really felt like you, like you could have cut some of the interpersonal relationships. Mm. Um, this seemed maybe unnecessary. But, you know, so just those brought it down a little bit, but I enjoyed it. I wasn't, you know, a B plus. I wasn't upset I watched it at all. It was on Netflix. Didn't have to go anywhere. Um, Danny's the one brought it up because it's in theaters in Dubai, interestingly enough. And it's at our most independent theater in Denver is the only place that's showing in Colorado. Otherwise, yeah. Saw it on Netflix. It was number 10 on the top 10 most watched things this week. So I was like, hey, Danny talked about it. I'm going to watch it. And yeah, drags a little bit would cut some of the interpersonal stuff, but very entertaining film. That's my B so plus. Entertain- so it's, it's, it's entertaining. How is the, uh, how does my broad strokes opinion about Netflix movie fall into this one in terms of character? I almost don't that? even think it is a Netflix made movie. I can't remember because Danny's seeing it at You're theaters, like right I now. said. Let's see here. But I would say it's Let much better than the average Netflix movie if I were to compare it. I mean, not a lot of style. It's, it's a World War II movie. They're not doing a lot of like, it's, it's gray. It's a gray movie. You know, like not a giant color palette. It's a period piece. Yeah, it, look, World it, War look, II. it looks very much like a standard Netflix movie. Yeah, well, it looks like almost like an imitation game. Yeah, like like most of those movies just kind of have that. Like just like how they always show Egypt the wrong way by like throwing on a filter, which uh, the director mm. of Moon Knight can <laughs> complained about <laughs> or like extraction where they throw on a filter it's like it's india look at how yellow than orange the sky is the sky the same thing like, like most world war ii movies it's like it's gray they're in london if everything if looks if terrible it's not a, if it's not a first world country throw a you know a, a yellow tint over it yeah if it's in mexico like they do in a breaking bad whenever they go to mexico it's just like everything has yeah that they tint. actually do it looks much different than albuquerque somehow even though they're yeah. like miles apart <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? It's like five miles apart, but it's Mexico. We have to show that it's different. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, Gilligan. <laughs> or Gilligan. this is a movie that was distributed by WB in the UK. Um, so is it so, Warner Brothers uh, movie more than a Netflix movie? I don't think they produced it. Uh, it looks like it, it may have just basically been an independent movie. Film Nation or Entertainment is the top credit. Oh, okay, so Netflix probably bought the rights here. Right, exactly. So yeah, I wouldn't say so, it feels like a, a Netflix movie completely. It just feels like your typical World War II color or World War I like color palette where it does nothing's very interesting. In fact, so much of it was set at night and I'm watching it during the day and I have like my window right here, my, my patio. It's like, I can't see some of these scenes. Like too much of this is at night. Like what's going I on? I hate that. But I hate that. That is my pet peeve. And that's like the Game of Thrones thing where everything is like, dark and at night it's like i can't see shit unless i'm like sitting completely in dark <laughs> frustrating frustrating um yeah we need to get past this phase of of those things where it's just like i guess so many different shades of black that we're just gonna shoot this entire movie in different shades of black and need more batman the it. batmans and less that like, yeah the batman was lit so well the batman was amazing and how it was dark but it was always clear and colorful. Like you never, I never had a hard time seeing. Yeah, it was colorful, but still dark. I never had a yep. hard time seeing what was happening. You only did when you were supposed to have a hard time seeing, like when Batman's completely in the shadows and the guys are like firing at him, or the beginning right. where you just hear his steps go clomp, clomp, clomp before you've even met him. But yeah, yeah. anything else to talk about this week? This this episode, Jammer. 
No, I think, I think I'm good. Uh, you, you kind of sold me on Operation Mincemeat. I don't know when I'd have time, but I'm at least intrigued. Uh, you know, I was, it was one of those things where I saw, I was like, ah, Netflix, ah, World War II, not really that interested, but oh, well, I'll watch it anyway. And then I just didn't have time. So um, I'm at least more intrigued to, to watch it than I was before, for sure. Cool. And uh, Kyle already told me before the show that he's planning on doing it because he actually knew about the event from his study of history before. And I never heard of it until me neither. Uh, Danny yeah. shared that, that he that's at theaters and he gave me that short plot description. So cool. Well, let's wrap her up, wrap her up, wrap her up. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another excellent episode of Breaking Geek Radio, the podcast. We can, of course, be found on the genre of podcast John Reverse Podcast Network, <laughs> um, which, you know, we have our, uh, you can find us on lrmonline.com, John Reverse Podcast Network.com. Um, <laughs> they both go to the same place. I was making sure I had the exact URL. Is it right? just, uh, is it just John Reverse. Oh, John Reverse.com. Thank you, Kyle. Um, basically, wherever you find podcasts, we got that John Reverse page um, where you can go down and watch, listen to any of our shows like Anime Versal Reviews. Um, the Katina, Marvel Multiverse Madness, us, a few other. Mayhem. I don't know. If Ka- Mayhem. God damn. Did you brain. just get your own name wrong? I've done yeah, it before yes, on the did. show. <laughs> um, have we had? And then, of course, um, on YouTube, you can watch almost all these shows. Uh, Kyle is a great producer. Um, and uh, he also has the most amazing trailer reactions. I'm not just saying that because he's on our channel or he's my friend, but. Kyle's reactions are now my favorite trailer reactions because he gets so into it. It's uh, you have to watch the one for Nope if you've never seen it because he's like ah ah <laughs> because of the grace. All, all, it's funny like all, all of the uh, the the supportive comments that he got on that one too. Everyone being like you know just like totally like, yeah right like I, I react the same way. You know, that, that movie Fire in the Sky is a is a bitch if you see it too young man. That that label based on a true st- story, like in in the night in the nineteen nineties, you know, I'm eight eight years old. That like that's that means it's true. Da- damn it! <laughs> yeah, I yeah. saw arachnophobia way too old, and I can't stand spiders. But that reminds me of, of growing up, and then whenever the news would come on, I'd be like, "No, I don't want to watch the news because the news is always scary. Like, you're gonna die tomorrow if you go outside." And as a kid, you just you know you didn't know any better. I still don't drink Odwalla, whatever brand, uh, apple juice, because it killed like a couple dozen people in the U.S. with Campylobacter or something. Um, But anyway, finishing up the wrap up of the show, find us on YouTube again. All the anywhere you listen to podcasts, you know, like the video, like our like uh, whatever service you listen to. Give us a review. Uh, Join our discord. You can talk about us. Tell us how much you hate our stuff. Give us recommendations for what you'd like to hear us talk about. Um, and, and don't just that, talk about us, talk with us. Yeah, talk with us. We're there. Your favorite celebrities are all there. Um, Jammer, where can they out be if foundeth? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jam the Writer and all of my books under the name AJ Cerna on Amazon and Audible. And I'm Nick Dahl um, at Geeky Nick. I don't know why I said my real name. <laughs> We've already established it. <laughs> I'm <laughs> at Geeky Nick Dahl on Twitter. And I can be found in Marvel Multiverse Mayhem. I said it right that time. And right here on Breaking Geek Radio, the podcast every Friday. And with that, hasta lasagna. Don't get any on ya. Mission accomplished. Red light, green light. What? What is that? He wanted to add some fourth one for some reason.